Thank you, Doug. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I have a short movie to show you in just a minute to kind of really most efficiently uh, express to you the progress over the last three years where we're at. Uh, before I get to that, though, I do want to touch on a couple of the, uh, the issues that I know get, uh, get discussed now and then uh, in the community, and I, I thought I'd update you on our progress on those. So next chart. First, this is the, this is the key uh, driving uh, aspects of our lunar mission that we're designing to. And, and, and while, uh, while many of these, uh, or all of these, affect the, the solution for going to the moon, we, uh, we, the couple of them are, are most significant. Gr global lun lunar access, global surface access, is really probably the, 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 the main driver in, in what size is this architecture. Uh, but all those uh, parameters have been studied. They've been, they've been parameterized. We've, we've done uh, a significant amount of work to understand what this integrated architecture must do, as, as Duck was, uh, was pointing out in his remarks. Next chart. And we've looked beyond the moon. We, we, we've gone and refreshed. The, uh, the Mars studies of the 90s for human mis missions to Mars, and to refresh that, looking at it from the, from the standpoint of applying constellation elements and, uh, and making sure that the, the decisions that we're making today have a feed forward, not just to the moon, but actually are building a capability that will eventually result in a, an ability to, to realize a, a human Mars mission. Next chart. And we've looked at other applications of this hardware. There, there's many possible things that one can do with this robust, heavy lift architecture that we're trying to, uh, trying to foster with Constellation. We've, we've got uh, a, a capability to put uh, cargo on board the Orion, be able to do uh, missions other than, than just the, the crew transport mission to the space station or, or to meet up with a lunar lander in, in low Earth orbit. Uh, we've looked at other applications of the uh, us and others have looked at other applications of the Ares 5 lift capability. Not only is it unprecedented in terms of the amount of mass it can lift to, the, to low Earth orbit, uh, but, but also the volume. We've, we've sized it so that volumetrically it, is, it, it will be unprecedented. Uh, in this cartoon here, the lower, lower right, is, that's not a sophisticated uh, satellite. That's, a, that's a several school buses that are stacked inside the, the Ares 5 shroud. V very significant capability. Next chart. And so here's a couple of the, the main issues that, uh, that folks uh, uh, bring up every now and then or they hear about that uh, I thought I'd give you the, the latest information on. First of all, uh, all, as we've just pointed out, it's an integrated architecture. And so uh, mass is one of the driving parameters, uh, both the, the lift capability of the rockets and how much the elements that the rockets carry weigh uh, as you go through the entire uh, life cycle of a mission from, from uh, lift off at the, on the launch pad until the crew is recovered uh, after landing. And so uh, here's where we're at today with, uh, for the ISS mission for the in amount of margin that we are currently carrying. Uh, for Ares-1, uh, it has 22% lift capability margin, uh, and which is very good for where we're at, at, at today, which is just after PDR for, uh, for the rocket. The spacecraft sitting at 23% mass margin for the ISS mission. And I am holding at my, pro my program level an additional 5% margin of, on top of that. We're doing very well for block one of uh, Orion and, uh, and for Ares-1. The lunar mission, uh, still healthy margins, but uh, uh, probably the, the most driving one that you see there on the chart is the 10% for Orion. Uh, we'll watch that very closely. I've got that additional 4% in my pocket uh, in the event that uh, that we need that, but uh, the rocket, again, Ares-1, doing very well to be able to lift the Orion to do uh, both the lunar mission and the ISS mission. The limiting factor in this architecture uh, today is, uh, in terms of the Orion's mass, is its ability to land under the parachutes. Uh, the, 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 the mass limit for, for the three big main parachutes is really the, the driving uh, the parameter that sizes the how, how heavy the Orion can be. Uh, it, is not the, it is not the lift capacity of the rocket. Another issue that gets talked about is, uh, is what we call tower clearance or, or launch drift, and this, this received some uh, notable mention a few months back. Um, if, if one goes and looks at uh, a video of the uh, Saturn V lifting off launch pad during Apollo, uh, watch it closely from the right vantage point, and you'll watch that launch vehicle walk off the pad uh, away from the launch, actually steer away from the launch tower. And the Apollo 
Apollo crew members speak quite eloquently of, about the, what that sensation was like. Well, this is no different in this case. Every, every launch vehicle needs to assure its way as it takes off the launch pad. Uh, we have one specific wind direction with a very stiff wind, near, near hurricane force winds, where, uh, where we would need to steer away, actually steer away from the, the launch tower, which, uh, which we, can, uh, we can easily do. We have a, a design in place that, uh, that could uh, realize that. Uh, we can also uh, look at, uh, at, at, the, uh, at limiting the, the wind conditions for that one case. Uh, which would not, uh, which would not be a, a significant impact at all to our what we call our launch availability, our probability of launching on any given day of the year uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. So that uh, that issue is is for uh, all intents and purposes uh, really now just focused on how do we minimize plume damage to the launch tower as the, the vehicle flies away. Uh, for any rocket and spacecraft system, uh, one of the driving uh, uh, the driving issues that, that designers deal with is induced uh, environments. That's the, that's the loads and, and the weather that you've got you to gotta fly through and the speeds at which the rocket is traveling and what that induces on um, both the rocket and, the, and its payload. And uh, one of the, the conditions that gets talked about quite a bit is uh, the phenomena of thrust oscillation. And this is the phenomena of, for about a 10 second period in the 130 second burn of the first stage for about a 10 second period, the, the solid, which is really just a big tube, uh, has a resonant frequency. It's like an organ pipe. And so there can be conditions where for that, for that five to 10 second period, it can resonate in a way that will vibrate not just the solid motor, but the entire vehicle if the, if the vehicle's tuned up to it. So we have taken uh, active steps to mitigate that through uh, putting in isolation planes between the solid and the second stage and between the second stage and the spacecraft in order to mitigate that and we're moving forward with those designs. And that, uh, that design will give us not just a, uh, not just a, uh, for, for a single set of conditions but for a range of conditions that could, uh, worst case conditions that could, could occur with that phenomena. Um, in addition to that, we, we're working, continue to work as every uh, team of rocket designers does work, does, we work on uh, vibroacoustic loads, in other words, the sound levels, both at liftoff and during flight, the sound levels uh, have to be accounted for in the design and, of, of the spacecraft and of the rocket and selection of the components. And uh, that's all normal work for us. Next chart. Loss of mission, loss of crew. Uh, this is where we, we want to we make a, uh, a historical jump in the safety of the, of the systems, both for launch and in flight. Uh, 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 an order of magnitude improvement over what we enjoy with the space shuttle today. Uh, we, we believe that, uh, that we are on a path to achieve that. Uh, the, sp the, the rocket and the spacecraft, uh, from our abort capability perspective today, uh, we're doing a, a much better, better than 10 times of what uh, the statistical analyses of the shuttle suggest with respect to the ascent risk. Uh, and over 60 vehicle design changes have been made, and, and we're, we've driven into Constellation a risk-based design culture that, that looks at the probabilities of, of particular components failing, what, they, what their implications are to the mission and to the crew's safety, and we have made our selections in terms of architectures in, the, in spacecraft systems and selection of components in order to make uh, the, the, most, the safest and most reliable spacecraft and, and rocket system that we can. Uh, Post-landing crew survival, we've got, uh, we've got a system that can, can uh, survive for 24 hours, landed anywhere in the water uh, in the world, uh, and, uh, and we've also made sure that under the contingency condition that the spacecraft should land on land, that the, that, that is in fact a survivable event for the, for the flight crew. Uh, Budget has continued to be a, a challenge. Uh, there have been many, many uh, numbers floated out there as to what the total cost to initial operating capability is today. We stand at $35 billion. That's with reserves to achieve the March of 2015 goal, and that's with a confidence level and cost of 65 percent. In other words, two-thirds a chance that it will not cost any more than $35 billion. That's really what all that really means. Uh, we did have an original plan. <coughs> to spend uh, within the time frame of, of now through 2015 uh, an additional 
roughly $9 billion to get started on the phase A of the lunar program, that's ARES-5 and Altair. That, uh, that whole activity, of course, is under review by this panel. Um, and schedule. Schedule for ISS initial operating capability. Uh, our external commitment of March of 2015 is stable today. We have a plan to get to, get to that date. We, uh, we are, by the, the shape of our funding profile, we are challenged to make sure that we get the right components in the pipeline to get the spacecraft built so we can get it qualified, tested, and verified to meet that uh, March of 2015 date. Uh, so we are, we are undergoing uh, right now, as Doug alluded to, uh, a program-wide content review looking at the entire breadth of content in the Constellation program to see if there's any economies that we can find, whether we can, we can eliminate certain configurations. Uh, and and one, of those, one of those notable ones was the six versus four crew. Uh, we, we eliminated that strictly to simplify the path to get to initial operating capability of March 2015, and that was worked in very close coordination with the space station program. Next chart. So here we'd like to show our little video, if we could. Hope is, of course, that the technology cooperates with us here. It has been three short years. NASA began a journey to create the next space program, one that would take us beyond Earth orbit, returning us to the moon, and extending our reach to Mars and beyond. No longer just a program on paper, Constellation has projects, hardware, and software in every stage of development. In just three years, Constellation is ready for its first test flights, launching a new era of human space exploration. Through the Constellation program, NASA has taken a vision, the idea of exploring beyond low Earth orbit, and strategically created a detailed space architecture, a plan to make the vision a reality. Constellation begins by conducting missions to the International Space Station, using the Space Laboratory as a destination and proving ground for a new generation of spacecraft. Next, Constellation sets its sights on the Moon, exploring the lunar surface in ways never before possible. Unlike Apollo, which was limited to the exploration of the lunar equator, Constellation's architecture will allow astronauts to explore anywhere on the Moon staying twice as long as the Apollo missions, with twice as many crew members. This extended exploration capability has been a driving force for all of the Constellation spacecraft designs, which will be able to lift more mass and travel farther than any previous spacecraft. The Orion spacecraft is the crew exploration vehicle for Constellation, Orion borrows its shape and aerodynamic performance from Apollo, saving time and design work as well as reducing risk. However, the spacecraft is greater in size than Apollo, featuring updated computers, life support, electronics, heat protection, and other systems. The development of the Orion spacecraft is well underway. Several test articles have already been constructed and are being evaluated at NASA centers and engineering centers across the nation. Parachute drops have been conducted to test how Orion will return crews safely to Earth. The launch abort system, capable of pulling the spacecraft and its crew to safety in the event of an emergency, is set for a full-out test in 2009 while the rocket motors used in that system have already been evaluated in preparation for that flight test.
The launch vehicle for Orion is called Ares-1. It features two key components utilizing legacy hardware. A solid rocket booster, similar to that used by the space shuttle, comprises the lower stage of Ares-1. The upper stage features a J-2X liquid fuel rocket engine, derived from an Apollo-era rocket engine. Using these proven systems, the Ares-1 will get the crew into Earth orbit. The Ares-1 project completed its preliminary design review, the first such milestone in more than 35 years for a U.S. rocket. A test flight article of the Ares-1, called the Ares-1X, is slated for launch in 2009. The test flight will be a major turning point in the program, providing essential data on avionics, thrust vector control, and other systems, validating computer models by actually flying a full-scale vehicle. In preparation for the test flight, segments of the Ares-1X have already arrived at the Kennedy Space Center for assembly and processing. In addition, tests continue in all facets of the Ares program, from computer simulations, to wind tunnel tests, to engine test firings, providing engineers with the best information possible on how the crew launch vehicle will perform. Ares-5 is the heavy lift cargo launch vehicle. It will carry the lunar lander and other large components into space. Again, using legacy hardware, the Ares-5 will utilize solid rocket boosters during liftoff to help get the vehicle into orbit. The crew on board the Orion will rendezvous with an Earth departure stage of Ares-5. The entire stack Orion, the lunar lander, and the Earth departure stage is then sent toward the moon once again using the J-2X rocket motor. Because several key components of Ares-5 are the same as Ares-1, much of the engineering work being done applies to both vehicles, from solid rocket booster tests to firings of the J-2X rocket engine, which is the first component to pass beyond the critical design review phase. In all, the Ares-5 will be able to lift more mass than any previous spacecraft. Studies have already been conducted to see how this versatile craft could be used to launch scientific payloads, satellites, and even space telescopes. The Altair Lunar Lander will carry four astronauts to the moon. Larger and more robust than its Apollo predecessor, Altair will be able to land anywhere on the lunar surface, even the lunar poles, previously an unreachable target by manned spacecraft. The Constellation program recently completed a lunar capability concept review, demonstrating how the Altair lunar lander will reach the moon and later help build lunar outposts. Spatial studies by engineers have helped determine the interior layout of the lander, driving out better ergonomic designs for the crews who must live on board for extended stays on the moon. Additionally, work has already started on testing and improving all the gear needed for exploration in the Constellation era. From lunar rover tests, to planetary spacesuits, to tools, NASA is taking hardware out of the laboratory and into the field to achieve the best possible designs. In addition to the hardware development, NASA facilities are updating their capabilities for Constellation. New launch pads, lightning safety systems, firing rooms, factories and testing facilities are being completed to accommodate the new wave of exploration requirements. Most importantly, the Constellation program is about people. From around the nation, all NASA centers are engaged in this new exploration effort. Problem solving, building, testing, and taking on the challenges of human space exploration. It is an effort that brings together generations, those who experienced the Apollo moon landings and those who came after. Together, they are working on a brighter future, looking to return to the moon and go beyond. As the Constellation program leaps off the drawing table and onto the launch pad, a new chapter in exploration history is being written, one milestone at a time.
Okay, if we could uh, re just return to the charts briefly here. Uh, Doug, uh, we got a hard cutoff with the gotcha. video conference coming right up. So, so uh, with that, time. there's photographs in the back of additional hardware, and, uh, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Doug, sir. thank you very much. And uh, I think we've all got a lot of questions. Uh, we won't have time to take it right now.